I hope you are doing well and staying safe at home. Welcome back to my channel and I hope all the sessions that we have covered so far have been helpful to you. If you have any questions and concerns, please do mention in the comment section below. In today's session, we would work on your metallurgy chapter in a one shot video. We won't be working on any questions in this session. Questions video would be the next one that I'll put out. In this one, we will go through the entire theory and understanding of the concepts of metallurgy. So let's get started. So students, let's get started with the chapter. So uh, if we think about metallurgy, what do we mean by metallurgy? Okay. So metallurgy is extraction of metals. So we extract metals in a way that we can utilize them. We can use them for our benefit. So that is what we understand by metallurgy. So let's get started with the basics of metals that you need to know. Now, I always say that when you think about the definition of metals, whatever you have learned so far, just put everything on that definition. So you have understood that metals are ductile in nature. They can be drawn into sheets, they can be drawn into wires, they have um, high densities and they have high melting point. So anything that you remember for metals, just put everything in the definition. So let's look at the basic. So metals are those elements which can be drawn into sheets or pulled into wires, have high densities, high melting boiling point and high tensile strength and are good conductors of heat and electricity. So all the basic small small information that you have studied about metals since your 8th grade, just combine them and form a definition. Moving on, copper was the first metal to be used by man for making utensils, weapons and for other purposes. Now why only copper? Okay, Why no other element? So for example, if we think about aluminium, aluminium is the most abundant uh, metal in like produced on earth. So it's available in abundance, then why not aluminium and why copper? So the reason is that copper is easily available in its native or free state. Whereas aluminium was later discovered that you know these, these things are mixed together and in this part we have aluminium present. So back in the days people did not know how to take out aluminium and utilize that. Whereas copper was just available as is in the native or free state. So they were able to take out, take out copper and utilize it for their purposes. Therefore, copper was the first metal to be used by man. There are total 118 elements that we know so far. And of course, in future, we do not know how many more may come forward. But for now, we know 118 elements. Now, iron is a constituent of blood. Now, what we are talking about in this part is, we are talking about the metals that are uh, not available outside on the earth's crust but are important for our, our well-being. They are present in us. So for example, iron, it is part of our blood in the, in the way, in what form? In the form of hemoglobin. Then zinc is present in insulin. Insulin is produced to control sugar levels. Cobalt is present in vitamin B12. Magnesium is present in chlorophyll, that is a plant pigment. So let's mark all that. So you have iron in blood, zinc in insulin, cobalt in vitamin B12, magnesium in chlorophyll. So I hope this basic understanding is clear for metals. Moving on to non-metals. Non-metals except hydrogen are the elements which form negative ions by the gain of electrons. If I think about metals, what kind of bonds do they form? So in this case, if you see non-metals make a negative ions by the gain of electrons, metals form a positive ion by the loss of electrons. So you can also use that definition. It's up to you which definition you want to go for. So non-metals except hydrogen. Why do we say except hydrogen? Because ex hydrogen can just has one electron. Sometimes it can gain, sometimes it can lose depending upon the situation. So we always say except hydrogen. Now, there are few non-metals and where are they uh, generally uh, found or what are their uses. So we are going to look at those for now. 
So hydrogen is used in hydrogenation of vegetable oils to make ghee. So the details of this, how the hydrogenation happens will be covered in organic chemistry. So hydrogenation, if you just understand the basics of it, is when you have oil, uh, you try to make it more stabilized and then you use hydrogen, you add hydrogen to the compound and that is known as hydrogenation. So addition of hydrogen and then it is also used as a fuel. Then moving on to carbon. Carbon, ca carbon is a very, if carbon was not there, we won't have the entire organic chemistry. So carbon is present in a lot of things, almost everything. So you have proteins, fats, carbs, enzymes, vitamins, uh, which are essential for the growth and development of living organisms. Everything has carbon in it. Moving on, we have oxygen. Oxygen is important for our respiration. It is important for combustion. So respiration and combustion. Then when we talk about nitrogen, nitrogen reduces the rate of combustion and therefore it is also used to preserve food. So reduces rate of combustion. It is slightly on the inert side. It is not very reactive. So it is also used to preserve food. So I hope this much is clear students. Now all metals are solids except mercury. Exceptions, you have to remember the exceptions. This is nothing new. You have covered this all in your previous classes. So we are going to go with a faster pace on this. If at any point you think you're not getting it, you want to take a note of things, pause the video, take a note. If not able to follow, leave a comment in the comment section and I will be happy to help you out. Moving on, we have 11 non-metals which are gases. Now how many total non-metals do we have? We have 17 non-metals. Out of 17 non-metals, 11 are gases. Bromine is a liquid and remaining are solids. Now elements which can show some properties of metals as well as non-metals are known as metalloids. You have the names right here, boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium and polonium. So all of these are your metalloids which show certain properties from both the sides. They show some properties of metals as well as they show some properties of non-metals. Moving on, we have occurrence of metals. Where do we find metals? Where do they occur? So majority, all the, all the metals occur naturally in the earth's crust. Okay. So the earth's crust is the biggest source of metals. Metals can either occur in their native or free state. Native or free state we discussed about copper if you remember. So it is your native and free state or in combined state and combined it can be combined with some other element or it could be combined with uh, let's say some uh, dust, silica or some particles of the earth's crust. So that will be your combined state. Now metals which are less reactive and do not react under normal conditions with what? With oxygen, water, carbon dioxide and other common reagents. Why do we take these reagents? Because these reagents are present in our atmosphere. Okay. So if there are certain elements which do not react with the regular elements found in nature like oxygen, water, carbon dioxide. So that will actually stay in their native state and not in combined state. For example, you have gold, platinum, very less reactive elements. Uh, so they won't combine with oxygen, they won't combine with water. They will be easily able to find in their native state. Whereas if you have something more reactive like sodium, potassium, so those would be combined with elements present in nature and you'll have to purify them, extract them, follow the whole process to make sure that you're getting 99.8% uh, purity or 100% purity, you try to get the maximum purity possible. So I hope everything is clear so far. Let's move on. So you have gold and platinum, less reactive metals. So they occur in native state, that is free state. These you should remember. Sodium, potassium, majority, majorly found as chlorides. Calcium, magnesium as carbonates. Aluminium in oxide, zinc, lead, copper, mercury in sulfides. 
so these you should remember now moving on what do we understand by minerals so minerals are your uh, naturally occurring compounds okay so they occur in nature and uh, they have they can be a mixture of sand limestone rocks and your element okay so this mixture is known as mineral and when they have all these impurities with that the sand the silica limestone those are known as your gang particles or matrix now why do we call them minerals because these are a combination of stuff that is your metal with all of the uh, extra stuff now what is what is an ore if this is mineral what is an ore so ore is exactly same as mineral but from an ore the metal quantity is higher so you can utilize that and take it into a lab and extract the metal from it at a beneficial amount in mineral what may happen is that a large amount of impurities are present and only 5 10% of the metal is present so it is not feasible to use a mineral to extract the element whereas in an ore you have higher percentage of metal when you purify it you have less money getting spent on it and you have more output coming out so you have more metal coming out and less effort going in so those are your ores okay let's look at the definitions minerals are the naturally occurring compounds of metals which are generally mixed with other substances such as soil mud sand silica limestone rocks etc these earthly impurities are called gang particles or matrix they can ask you what are gang particles and or what's a matrix so you should know that moving on to ores ores are those minerals which metals are extracted commercially commercially means at an industrial level at a comparatively lower cost and with minimum effort that means when of course we are putting in efforts we would like a good amount of output coming out if i am if the entire industry is uh, processing something and you do not get enough output then what is the point of it that after uh, processing the entire uh, 100 kgs of your uh, gang particles and 100 kgs of your mineral you only get like uh, half a kg of the metal what is the point of that that is a lot of effort and money wasted so to avoid that ores are those minerals in which you have higher percentage of metals and which is easily accessible at a commercial level therefore we say that all minerals are not ores but all ores are minerals so all ores that means whatever ore we use in commercial levels is a mineral only is a mineral but all ores but all minerals are not ores because from all minerals you cannot have a commercial extraction happening so i hope this is clear now in soluble ores the ores which are not soluble are found as rocks so uh, insoluble ones would be like when we mine okay when we mine as in we dig into the earth we try and figure out we get a uh, huge sized rocks which are a mixture of your silica stones and your metal okay those are your insoluble ores the ones which are soluble what happens is that when we have rain uh, so the rain washes away those ores and then eventually with the river these ores your uh, mixed in water will reach the sea so for those extraction we have mining happening in seas we dig up in and we try and figure out and try and get collect whatever we can find find there so depending upon what we are extracting and what kind of ore that is either it will be present in the rock format or it would be washed away with rain and found in sea water okay so i hope this basic understanding is clear so far okay students one thing uh, for you to remember is that anything that we are covering in this session is all you need to know about metallurgy there is nothing else in the syllabus so as per the board syllabus whatever we cover in this session make sure you understand everything well and make sure any doubts and concerns are addressed so have patience and stick with me moving on 
to common ores of aluminium so bauxite now bauxite is the most common ore of aluminium its uh, full name is hydrated aluminium oxide you need to remember the formula as well so formula you need to remember for all three aluminium ores next is cryolite sodium aluminium fluoride na2alf6 keep repeating after me you have bauxite al2o3.2h2o you have cryolite na2alf6 you have corundum that is al2o3 okay all three ores so for aluminium all three of them are important the most common one is bauxite they can ask you what is the most common ore of aluminium bauxite hydrated aluminium oxide then for iron the iron and zinc you only have to remember the names it's okay if you do not remember the formulas it's fine so the most common one is red hematite common and for zinc the most common is zinc blend when we say common that means at commercial level this is the this is the ore that is used maximum so common ores of iron red hematite brown hematite magnetite iron pyrites and what siderites so you have to remember the names and their chemical chemical names common names and chemical names and hydrous ferric oxide hydrated ferric oxide terri ferric uh, tetra oxide iron disulfide and ferrous carbonate so you have to remember all these names moving on for zinc you have zinc blend the common one which is also zinc sulfide then you have zinc side and calamine so you need to remember these formulas you don't have to okay now moving on to the most important part of the chapter that is extraction of aluminium let's understand what do we understand by just aluminium okay what do we know about it we know that aluminium has a symbol al its color is silvery white it's a silvery white metal what is the configuration the configuration is 283 what is the atomic number it is 13 since you have three valence electrons your valency is also 3 now aluminium is the most abundant metal in the earth's crust okay so you have it present in abundance then it is a reactive metal and does not occur in the free state so of course aluminium will form bonds and aluminium will be found in combined state when was it discovered it was discovered in 1825 by orsted okay now what happened at back then was that aluminium was considered an expensive metal it was more expensive compared to gold and silver why was that although aluminium was present in abundance it was in huge quantities but still it was the most expensive metal back then and kings and queens would use aluminium for their utensils because it was considered an expensive metal they would like to wear uh, aluminium stuff they would uh, like to eat in aluminium plates why was that the reason behind this was that when they would extract aluminium there were certain restrictions for them they did not know the correct way to extract aluminium so the whole process of extracting aluminium was so expensive that by the time you would get aluminium metal the entire costing of that was gone high so initially the reason why aluminium was expensive was because the extraction and purification of aluminium was expensive although eventually by 1885 that thing was completely changed and scientists that was hall and herlow they both were able to identify a way cheaper method to extract aluminium by making changes in the process they were using and once that happened aluminium became so cheap and so easily available that in every house you would find aluminium utensils not just the kings and queens so drastically the costing of aluminium dropped so let's look at that so aluminium is the most abundant metal found in the earth's crust 
it is reactive hence found in combined state it was discovered in 1825 hall and herlow in 1885 developed the process of extraction of aluminium important to understand now aluminium is extracted from its main ore that is bauxite ore that is al2o3.2h2o this is the most common ore of aluminium and we use that to extract aluminium from bauxite contains 60% of al2o3 the rest being sand ferric oxide and titanium oxide so as we just discussed aluminium exists in combined state that means other than aluminium there will be other elements that have combined with aluminium and formed the ore so you have sand you have ferric oxide you have titanium oxide okay so there are different things that are present in aluminium now moving on it is concentrated or purified by chemical method why do we need chemical method so there are different methods okay you have physical method and chemical method physical methods can be used for metals which are present in their native or free state that means they are not combined with other elements whereas when we talk about metals which are present in combined states for them we have to use chemical methods because by chemical methods you have to get se like separate out the combined elements from them you use different chemicals different uh, reactions and you separate out the metals so that is the reason we say it is concentrated or purified by chemical method now purification of bauxite ore that is your conversion of bauxite into alumina okay so um, now moving on to an important portion what do we have here we have purification of aluminium and in aluminium uh, we use the most common ore of aluminium that is bauxite ore what was bauxite ore try and think about it it was al2o3 dot 2h2o so we'll do the purification of that so let's begin with that this process is also known as bayer's process so the first part is it, i we have uh, uh, like i have divided that into different steps so we'll go step by step as to what we are doing in purification of bauxite ore okay our target is that from bauxite we can get alumina okay so we'll come on alumina and you'll understand what what is happening so the first is that grind the bauxite ore so bauxite ore since it is form found in combined state it is found in uh, in formation of big rocks with sand silica few other components mixed with that so the first thing we'll do is we'll grind it finely break it down finely and then heat it to remove the volatile impurities now what is the formula the formula is al2o3.2h2o so what will be the volatile substance in this part that would be your water so first grind your bauxite ore and then heat it to remove your volatile impurities once you have done that it is then heated under pressure so first you regularly heat it then you heat it under pressure with concentrated caustic soda what is caustic soda naoh for 2 to 8 hours at 140 to 150 degree celsius and this process is known as leaching you should know leaching as a separate process they can ask you what is leaching in purification of aluminium so it is when aluminium is heated under pressure with concentrated caustic soda for 2 to 8 hours for at what temperature 140 to 150 degree celsius so once that happens let's see what equation do we get we get al2o3 dot 2h2o plus naoh giving us naalo2 plus water so your water is coming out and what is naalo2 that is sodium meta aluminate so you are getting sodium meta aluminate okay bauxite dissolves and forms sodium meta aluminate now because of the amphoteric nature what will happen the insoluble impurities which are which is also known as red mud that will be left out 
that will be easily removed because those are insoluble impurities and rest will stay in the solution okay red mud consists of ferric oxide sand etc which are removed by filtration and these these are the impurities which are insoluble so let me mark that as well if they ask you what is red mud so red mud is the um, insoluble impurities present in are uh, present after leaching and that consists of ferric oxide sand and they can be removed by filtration so that is your red mud moving on to step number 3 on diluting sodium meta aluminate so you were left with sodium meta aluminate so you dilute that with water cool it down because you were at a high temperature cool it down to 50 degrees celsius and it gets hydrolyzed okay hydrolyzed as in converted to a hydroxide so it gets hydrolyzed to give aluminium hydroxide as a precipitate so it will get hydrolyzed to give aluminium hydroxide as a precipitate if you think in the previous case the insoluble portion left were the impurities now the insoluble portion left is your aluminium hydroxide that contains aluminium okay the other soluble impurities remain dissolved in the solution hydroxide so whatever is left whatever is soluble will be left in the solution okay let's look at the equation real quick so i have sodium alumin uh, sodium sorry sodium meta aluminate so naalo2 which is right here plus you added water to it and you brought it down to 50 degrees celsius so you got naoh and aluminium hydroxide and this aluminium hydroxide is your ppt precipitate so we have done three steps so far the first step grind your bauxite ore and heat it to remove the volatile impurities step number 2 heat it under pressure with concentrated caustic soda for 2 to 8 hours at 142 150 degree celsius when you do that you get sodium meta aluminate this sodium other than sodium meta aluminate whatever is insoluble impurities will be removed by filtration and these insoluble impurities are called red mud good job then step number 3 on diluting sodium meta aluminate you mix water to it once you have filtered out the impurities mix water to it bring down the temperature to 50 degrees celsius and convert that into hydroxide this hydroxide that is your ppt is your aluminium hydroxide and other are the impurities which are still sol sol like dissolved in the solution okay so this is what we have so far moving on to the fourth step the precipitate that you just got you filter it out wash it dry it and then heat it again to 1000 degrees celsius okay so the precipitate is filtered washed dried and ignited at 1000 degrees celsius to get alumina what is alumina al2o3 okay so now what is happening you are getting aloh whole thrice this was the ppt from your previous step you heat it at 1000 degrees celsius your aluminum the, that is your alumina and your water will get separated so this is your alumina that you were targeted you started with bauxite ore and you wanted to reach alumina you are at alumina now let's look at some notes and uh, some important points so aluminum oxide now at this stage what is happening you have got aluminum oxide al2o3 now you want to remove oxygen also but aluminum oxide has a great affinity to stay connected with oxygen and it is a stable compound so it is very difficult to get rid of oxygen and remove it from the compound so what we need to do we need to reduce it okay we need to perform a reduction experiment but reduction uh, reaction cannot happen with the regular uh, reducing agents like carbon uh, hydrogen carbon monoxide we can't use them why because aluminum oxide is a stable compound so what is the option that we are left with here we are left with electrolytic reduction we we'll use the process of electrolysis to reduce it that means take out oxygen from it so that is what this note is saying aluminum oxide due to its great affinity for oxygen is a very stable compound it is not reduced easily so not reduced easily by common reducing agents like carbon 
कार्बन मोनोऑक्साइड और हाइड्रोजन हेंस वॉट डू वी यूज स्टूडेंट्स वी यूज इलेक्ट्रोलिटिक रिडक्शन सो इलेक्ट्रोलिटिक रिडक्शन इज यूज नाउ वील अंडरस्टैंड वॉट इज इलेक्ट्रोलिटिक रिडक्शन नाउ ओके इलेक्ट्रोलिटिक रिडक्शन सो बिफोर वी स्टार्ट विद इलेक्ट्रोलिटिक रिडक्शन वॉट हैपन वॉज योर हॉल हर्डो प्रोसेस सो द प्रीवियस प्रोसेस वॉज नोन एज बेयर्स प्रोसेस दिस प्रोसेस इज नोन एज हॉल हर्डोज प्रोसेस सो in this case what happened was that they were doing experiments for quite some time and trying to understand how can we extract aluminum in a cheaper way so eventually hall hall realized that if he is making certain changes in the electrolytic solution that you have here that is your electrolyte then he saw some better changes he saw some bubbles of aluminum coming up so some shiny metal showing up and that is when he figured out what changes he could do so initially we had to maintain the temperature at 20 uh, 2050 that means 2050 degrees celsius for uh, electrolysis process of aluminum to maintain such a high temperature it was very difficult and expensive that is the reason extraction of aluminum was exp expensive so uh, by making certain changes which we'll discuss now he brought down that temperature from 2050 degrees celsius to just 950 degree celsius so in this entire process you have to maintain the temperature at 950 degree celsius and that reduced the cost and uh, that helped a lot in making the extraction of aluminum much faster so let's get into the process of hall hurdle so electrolytic reduction of fused alumina so you have alumina hall hurdle process so first let's understand what's happening on the diagram so you have an electrolyte you have an electrolyte which is this right here then inside if you see this black black part this entire is your carbon lining okay this is your gas carbon lining if you look closely the bottom part of the apparatus is inclined why is it inclined it is inclined because aluminum will slowly start getting collected at the bottom over here and then slowly because it will be molten aluminum it will slowly drag and drop like brought down to the tap because it would be liquid aluminum then you have the cathode if you see negative part this is the cathode it is connected to the entire that black portion that you can see in the whole electrolytic apparatus that entire thing is your uh, carbon lining that is your cathode what is anode if you see this is your anode these rods these are your graphite rods so all of these are your anodes okay so you understand what's anode you understood what is cathode and then you found uh, you saw your molten aluminum that is uh, sliding down then the collection tap okay so this is what your basic apparatus is now let's see now when we talk about electrolytic cell that means the apparatus that we have so it is a rectangular iron tank why are we taking iron because iron is um, is a better component when we think about any industrial equipments iron was very readily available back then so rectangular iron tank with sloping bottom sloping bottom to make sure aluminum is collected uh, through the tap the sloping bottom of the tank facilitates the removal of the molten aluminum the tank is lined with gas carbon okay i hope this much is clear now when we come on electrolyte <coughs> now when we come on electrolyte electrolyte is a mixture of three different types of aluminum aluminum ores actually so the first is your alumina alumina which is 20% cryolite which is 60% and fluorspar which is 20% again if they ask you what is the ratio of these three you'll say it's 1 is to 3 is to 1 So twenty is to sixty is to twenty is your one is to three is to one ratio. They can ask you that, okay? So these a mixture of these three are used, and we'll discuss at the end of the experiment why. Now powdered coke is sprinkled over the surface of the electrolyte. So if I come back here, and if you try and see, so at the top of the electrolyte, powdered coke is sprinkled. Why? To maintain the temperature of the electrolyte. and due to radiation you do not have any heat loss 
that is the reason we have it as a layer on the top now moving on the temperature now the molten electrolyte is kept at 950 degree celsius by electrical heating so i hope this is clear to you now that we are maintaining 950 degree celsius okay moving on we have the voltage so we actually use very low voltage that is 5 to 6 volts what is the reason for it the reason is that if you do if you use a higher voltage your cryolite that is the mixture that you are using in the electrolyte your cryolite may decompose instead of acting as a solvent in the electrolyte it may start decomposing because of high voltage okay so voltage used is 5 to 6 volts a low voltage is used to avoid decomposition of molten cryolite now let's look at the reactions so i have cryolite that is na2 alf6 how will it break down into the ions i'll have na plus al3 plus plus 6f okay fluor spur that is caf2 you have to remember these things caf2 so when you uh, decompose that you will get ca2 plus plus 2f minus then alumina that would give you two uh, two of al3 plus ions and three of oxygen ions okay now what are the positive ions here so positive ones is your sodium aluminum then you have calcium and aluminum again okay so out of these three positive ions aluminum lies lower in the electric uh, electrochemical series therefore aluminum will get discharged first or you can say that is the one that will get discharged others will not so it will have preferential discharging of aluminum happening out of these three positive ions if we think about the negative ions i have f and i have oxygen so out of these two oxygen will get discharged okay so let's see aluminum being lower in electrochemical series is preferentially discharged at the cathode while oxygen is at the anode now i hope this much is clear so so far we have understood that what kind of apparatus we have we have electrolyte carbon lining cathode anode and molten aluminum being collected we have electrolytic cell that is what is happening in the cell like what is the tank made up of how is the tank inclined then we have the electrolyte which is important it is a mixture of alumina cryolite and fluor spur 1 is to 3 is to 1 then we have the temperature to be maintained at 950 degree celsius we have a lower voltage why to avoid the decomposition of cryolite then we discuss the three reactions that was how is cryolite breaking down how is fluor spur breaking down and how is alumina breaking down once that happened we figured out the ions which are going on cathode and the ones which are going on anode moving on now we'll come on what is happening at cathode and what is happening at anode so let's see what is happening at cathode so at cathode what is what was cathode cathode was the inner carbon lining in the apparatus so inner carbon lining of the electrolytic cell and we discussed that positive ion will get discharged which one aluminum so let's look at the equation at the cathode so you will have 4 al3 plus plus 12 electrons giving you 4 al okay so aluminum is being discharged and it will uh, convert into molten uh, molecules and it will start uh, showing up at the bottom of the apparatus now what is happening at anode so anodes were the thick rods of graphite which were like hanging in the electrolyte so thick rods of graphite are suspended into the fused electrolyte and on this one you have oxygen being discharged so what would happen six ions of oxygen will lose 12 electrons and give you six nascent oxygens okay so you'll have this is nascent oxygen now out of these six nascent oxygens what would happen is three oxygens and three oxygens will combine to form three molecules of oxygen now oxygen does not get liberated as the gas at anode right there like directly what it would do is it since your anode is made up of graphite carbon rods it will oxidize your carbon 
okay so you have oxygen molecules uh, being discharged at anode those oxygen molecules will not come out uh, as an oxygen gas they will decompose or you can say they can they will oxidize your graphite carbon rods that are hanging so it will first uh, decom like first oxidize it to carbon monoxide and then oxidizes further to carbon dioxide so let's look at the equation anode is oxidized to carbon monoxide which further forms carbon dioxide so 3c plus o2 will give you 2co then 2co plus o2 will give you 2co2 okay i hope this much is clear what is happening at cathode and what is happening at anode and since your oxygen keeps reducing carbon from the graphite rods eventually you will have to change the graphite rods because they will become thinner and thinner further and once they become thinner of course you will lose the uh, electrolysis would stop you won't get a uh, sufficient amount of products so you have to eventually as the process is going on uh, one like once in a while you have to change those graphite rods now anode has to be replaced from time to time as it gets oxidized by oxygen evolved at the anode so that is exactly what i just told you moving on when the supply of alumina so alumina is being consumed as the amount of alumina starts reducing your voltage starts jumping up now why does that happen that is because alumina is a very like i won't say non conductor but it is it conducts very less amount of electricity so it does not it, i cannot say it's a non conductor entirely it does conduct electricity but at a very very low rate so as soon as your aluminum uh, sorry alumina starts decreasing in proportion in the electrolyte the voltage starts jumping back up so you can take a note of this when the supply of alumina decreases the voltage suddenly jumps from 40 to 60 volts if a bulb is attached to the apparatus it will grow brightly so it will start shining up very brightly why is that alumina is a non conductor of electricity thus when its concentration decreases the current supply increases which further increases the voltage so you can take a note of this important reasoning question now moving on if i come on notes so i told you that towards the end we'll see what is happening why are we using cryolite why are we using fluorspar in the electrolyte so the first is that your cryolite as i told you in the beginning of hall hall law process your cryolite will reduce the temperature required from 2050 degrees celsius to 950 because it was extremely expensive extremely difficult to maintain temperature at 2050 this was a great discovery so it lowers the fusion temperature from 2050 degrees celsius to 950 degrees celsius and increases the conductivity in the electrolyte so that is your uh, important portion for cryolite after that we have fluorspar why are we using fluorspar so it acts as a solvent for the electrolytic mixture it tries to keep it as a solvent the second is it increases its conductivity why do we need increase in conductivity because alumina is almost non conductor of electricity so if you are doing electrolysis process of course you need electricity passing through it and you need a solvent which enhances that okay so fluorspar is one um, compound that will act as a solvent and it will increase your conductivity the third important part is your powdered coke powdered coke is sprinkled on the surface of the electrolyte i told you that it reduces the heat loss and the second is it prevents the burning of anode okay i hope this is clear to you moving on we have a small flow chart to see what we did so the first is that we talk about so in the first portion that is your bayer's process you have the bauxite ore so bauxite ore <clears throat> what do you do your concern concentration by naoh to obtain al2o3 so what concentration means it is purification the first thing what do we do is leaching this is the process of leaching what happens in leaching high pressure with concentrated caustic soda um for 2 to 8 hours 140 to 150 degrees celsius the first step leaching 
the second is after leaching has happened you bring down the temperature mix it with water and bring it to 50 degrees celsius and you get a ppt which is hydroxide further you take this hydroxide uh, wash it dry it bring it to uh, or ignite it to 100 degrees celsius and you get al2o3 and water separated and this is your alumina that we were talking about this entire process is your bayer's process This process is known as Hall Herlow process. So in this process what happens is that you have alumina now electrolytic reduction is happening. So you what is your electrolyte alumina cryolite fluor spur what is the ratio 1 is to 3 is to 1. What is happening at cathode aluminum is being discharged at cathode. What is happening at anode first I am getting nascent oxygen it further reduces my graphite rods to give me carbon monoxide and then carbon dioxide. Then last portion is not in the syllabus so you can leave that out and from the uh, after the hall hollo process you get 99.8 percent pure aluminium after following all this process. So I hope this much is clear students. Next now uh, one more thing to add up here is that I will be sharing all the notes by the end of the session you can find them in the description section if you have doubts mention that in the comments and the board questions and last year um, important questions we will discuss that in a separate video all together for metallurgy now moving on to the last and a very small portion that is alloys what happens in an alloy so we have regular metals okay sometimes those metals cannot be directly used for solving a purpose so what do we do we mix some met metals together we bring out certain properties that we need to perform for example I want to make jewelry out of gold but pure gold is very soft it cannot maintain the shape or the structure of the jewelry so what I do I mix up some copper in that and then I make jewelry so what I am doing, I am putting in extra strength in my gold. So similarly, when you have to perform certain tasks, you can or certain properties that you need in a compound, then you mix certain metals or non-metallic with a non-metallic element and try to combine and make a compound which solves your purpose. That is what is alloy. Okay. So an alloy is a homogeneous mixture that is mixed up properly or you cannot separate them like that that's the reason we call it homogeneous so an alloy is a homogeneous mixture of two or more elements or one or more metals with certain non-metallic elements so that is the definition for alloys for example gold is too soft to be used without a small percentage of copper so gold in itself is super super soft then Amorphous alloys used in transformer coils are made by quick quenching of the molten metals. That means combining of molten metals. Moving on, alloys melting range is about 51 degrees Celsius to 260 degrees Celsius. Now that depends upon uh, like between this is a very vast range okay 51 to 260. So that depends upon what kind of metals we have used what kind of properties we have tried to combine depending on that our melting point will range so uh, alloys melting range uh, melting point range is between 51 degree celsius to 260 degree celsius now usually contain bismuth lead tin etc these alloys are called fusible alloys okay or fusible alloys so what do we have i have bismuth lead tin etc these alloys are called fusible alloys not possible alloys fusible alloys a steel containing up to 10 percent of elements such as chromium molybdenum nickel etc usually with low percentage of carbon is known as alloy of steel now you know that steel is a vast used element okay we use it in a lot of things so and steel is pretty much you can say it's very strong so how is the steel alloy made? So steel alloy is made with combining of all these with a low percentage of carbon 
and that gives us a strong uh, compound that is steel moving on we have amalgam so amalgam is whenever any alloy has mercury in it that uh, that alloy is known as amalgam so a mixture of an alloy with mercury with a number of metals it could be anything or alloys it could be any alloy it could be any metal so this mixture is known as amalgam such as sodium zinc gold and silver as well as some non metals is known as amalgam so i hope amalgam is clear then we have dental amalgam it is a mixture of mercury and silver tin alloy so dental amalgam is the one that when you are getting your implants your tooth implants and they use any particular metal like uh, silver or gold or something those are soft metals you can't keep them as your teeth you can't bite with that so you have mercury mixed with that and an amalgam is made so this is known as a dental amalgam that means mercury and silver tin alloy a strong alloy okay mercury doesn't form an amalgam with iron very very important to remember mercury does not form an amalgam with iron and hence mercury is commonly stored in iron bottles what kind of question do we expect here what kind of bottles is mercury stored in and why mercury is stored in iron bottles why because it does not form an amalgam with that what is the purpose of making alloys as i discussed earlier that it is to solve our requirements so the purpose of an alloy is to improve the specific usefulness of the primary components and not to adulterate or degrade it so we are not reducing its quality or properties we try and combine a few things and bring out properties that we need from that particular compound so students moving on to the exactly last portion of the chapter uh, you have what alloys that you need to remember so i have marked them here if you can see the ones which are in the red tick marks are the ones you need to remember so let's take a look at these so the first one is for aluminum both of them are important you do not have to remember the percentages but you do have to remember the composition that means what elements they are made up of so the first is duralium so that is made up of aluminum copper magnesium and manganese then magnesium is made up of aluminum and magnesium what are the properties so your first one is it is light hard resistance of corrosion and highly ductile aluminum imparts lightness magnesium imparts strength okay it resists now for the second one it resists corrosion it is light and it is strong okay so you can combine the properties and remember that majorly your alloys of aluminum they will be light they will be hard or uh, let us strong and they will be a uh, resistance of corrosion they would be resistant of corrosion then used for making what so bodies of aircrafts buses and tube trains light tools and pressure cooker okay so pressure cooker i think you'll have you'll remember that easily then other one you'll have aircraft scientific instruments metal mirrors light tools so light tools is common for both beams of balance and household appliances okay easy to remember and aluminum is the most asked one so you should remember that then for the next one iron you have to remember the stainless steel so what is stainless steel it is made up of iron chromium nickel and carbon what happens it resists corrosion it is shiny you you know that about stainless steel right it is resistant to acids and alkalis nickel and chromium imparts luster carbon imparts hardness what is where have you seen stainless steel you have seen that in cutlery you have seen in utensils in some ornaments in surgical instruments so those are your uses of this alloy moving on we have zinc and copper that is brass so for the first for the first one you have brass and bronze so that would be what you they are malleable and ductile so the first thing you can remember is that they are made up of copper and zinc of course then malleable and ductile they are where are they used they are used in decorative hard uh, decorative hardware i'm not sure why is that zooming out again and again let's see okay so they are malleable and ductile can be easily cast that means you can change the shape of it easily 
resists corrosion silvery and yellow in color so when we say resist corrosion again and again what do we mean by that and why do we need it now very basic thing whenever you are you combining any uh, elements and trying to get new properties of course you would not want that the that particular element goes bad or it is affected by corrosion or it is it gets rusted or it gets degraded in quality so that is the reason majority of alloys that are made the first thing that we look for is that they are resistant to corrosion so that their life is long and we can use those equipments those utensils for a longer period of time so let's look at this one so brass is used in decorative hardware utensils screws and handles cartilages containers musical instruments moving on you can take a look at bronze so bronze is made up of copper tin and zinc so your tin i have written that separately that that's tin now yeah the difference between brass and bronze uh, your brass does not have tin now hard and easily cast can take up polish and resists corrosion what are the uses it is used in making medals so you would have known like you get gold silver and bronze medal first second and third position so that's your bronze medal then it is all it was also used to make coins some places yes it is still used to make coins then the last portion that we have i'm not sure what is happening okay so the last portion that we have i have solder or fuse metal okay what is the type of metal you have lead here so let me just write that here. lead so you have lead percentage is not required now what is uh, the uh, the properties it will have low melting point um high tensile strength that means strong strength then um, these are imparting these uh, properties casting property capacity to expand upon a uh, solidification so this is no uh, this is used in soldering purposes fuse and printing blocks okay so i hope students everything that we have covered today is clear to you so icc warriors this is where we conclude today's session we have covered everything you need to know about the chapter metallurgy and for any doubts and concerns feel free to leave a comment in the comment section please do share like and subscribe this video and help us move forward looking forward to the next session and helping you further thank you so much